Hi, and welcome to the first Artist Resistance Artist Conversation of the Justice Reentry and Healthcare Virtual Summit. On behalf of the Institute Community Justice, I'd like to thank Philly Cam for making this possible. I'd first like to introduce Anne Marie Kirk with Art for Justice. Art for Justice supports and exhibits artwork from individuals currently in prison. They believe that an individual's artwork, no matter where it is made, brings to life the unique creativity of the maker. Through the artwork, the artist tells a story that initiates a conversation with each viewer. One of the ways that a prisoner, locked far from society behind layers of barricades, can communicate with the larger society is through art. Art for Justice exhibitions reach across deep divides in our society, reveal our shared humanity, and stimulate dialogue about how to achieve a functional, accessible system of justice for all. Anne-Marie Kirk. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and I hope I can represent our artist as, as best I can. I'm going to jump forward and read some quotes from some of the artists that we have represented. Charles Lawson is our co-founder, and he is the inspiration. And you can't hear it? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, everyone can hear. Okay. Charles, Charles Zafir Lawson is the co-founder of Art for Justice. And I'd like to speak first about him because it's his inspirational artwork, his unique style, and his thoughtfulness that has been a guiding light throughout our work. And we have brought artwork to over a hundred events and exhibits since 1997, always with the complete involvement of the artist. For every art show we do, there's a presentation, there's opportunity for conversation, and the artists write their own statement. And I am surrounded here by statements. So I'm going to read something that Charles Lawson wrote just recently. He wrote the conversations about systemic racism and injustice taking place in their streets and communities throughout this country are the very conversations I have been expressly illustrating in my art. So you see in his painting um, that's behind me, and you have it in your show, Life Interrupted, a scene into a prison cell. And you see him, this is a self-portrait, and how he is responding to a letter he's received from home. This is an incredible vision that you wouldn't see otherwise. And it's not anyone who told him to paint this. This is his contribution, letting us see into a world that has been locked away. So Charles Lawson's work, you can see it at artforjustice.org and I invite you to do so. I'd like to talk now about Daniel Gwynn. Daniel Gwynn is a man who has always claimed to be wrongly convicted, and he is on death row in Pennsylvania for this crime he did not commit. His story is amazing. I've read a lot of the case. I've read uh, information from a national expert, Professor Leo, uh, Dr. Leo, and he has a coerced confession. Anyway, he used his art as a way to survive the mental torture of solitary confinement. He writes, painting has been my therapy in a world devoid of any positive stimulation. It helped me survive the hostile environment while working towards the emotional baggage that drove me to hurting myself and my family by using drugs. Not that he did the murder, he did not. So if you look at this most recent painting, um, Alienation, it just shows the profound the profound gift that Daniel Gwynn has to compose a story in his art. And he's taken Lady Justice. He's made her into the way he sees Lady Justice, an African-American person, woman who's draped in the cloth and has she's breaking the chains of injustice with her sword. This is, well, that's Charles Lawson's painting, but there you go. And he titled this Alienation. And when he wrote it to me, it was A-L-I-E-N-A-T-I-O-N. In other words, alienation, we're all broken up. And Daniel has done this, been able to compose these amazing paintings um, throughout 
the years. We've been uh, writing to each other since uh, 2001. Uh, and I invite you again to go look at more of Daniel's work uh, and you will learn something from it. And I think his art has benefited the entire conversation about mass incarceration. The fact that he's wrongly convicted adds so much more to it. The other artist I wanna talk about is Rene Ortiz. His painting is an abstract and he found his way to abstract art um, by, through a program at uh, Graterford years ago when he met Mr. Jerry Givnish, who's the founder of the Painted Art, uh, the, the Painted Bride and an Art for Justice board member. So Angel, um, Rene Ortiz is another individual who is wrongly convicted. He signed a blank piece of paper and the police filled in the paper at a later date. Still, he has been caught for 30 years in the prison system and has not been able to have his issues addressed. I spoke with Rene just uh, about a week and a half ago, and I'm inspired by his, his absolutely beautiful way to, to proceed through this terrible injustice. And art is a vivid part of this. Uh, he was honored to be a part of this show today. And if you look at his painting, you'll see the eyes looking out and as they invite you to look into him, because there, it is his eye, he's looking out at you. He's looking out at, at us, charging us. What are we gonna do about a broken criminal justice system? Thank you so much um, to Anne-Marie Kirk with Art for Justice. Uh, that was a great uh, sort of introduction to the, um, to the pieces uh, that um, the artists that you're uh, working with have shared. Uh, second, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jalen A. Law. Jalen is a uh, professional artist, art educator, and social entrepreneur focused on building a thriving art scene in Buffalo, New York, that can serve as a launching pad for the area's talented emerging artists. To accomplish this, he founded the nonprofit organization Buffalo's Own Inc in the fall of 2018 with a mission to build a central resource and incubator for artists of all mediums and at all levels to grow their creative careers and build their artistic brands at the local, regional, and national levels. He is also the co-owner and curator of the local art space Urban Art Gallery established in July of 2019. Uh, Jalen Law. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jalen Law. Um, I as so as you so eloquently said about explaining uh explaining about my background I, i'm a full-time artist and educator from buffalo new york and i'm i'm happy today to be here to be able to share my experiences um documenting and discussing my artwork based around people who are incarcerated and what does freedom and what does freedom freedom mean overall so uh, one of my pieces that i submitted for for this for this exhibit um covers the life of one of the U one of the united states longest standing inmates in u.s histories Veranza Bowers Jr. Um, he is a former Black Panther, um, incarcerated for over 46 years. And I had the honor to meet him through one of my mentors who happened to be his daughter. Um, in 1973, he was convicted of a murder by a U.S. Park Ranger um, on the word of two government informers both of whom who receive reduced sentences for other crimes by the federal prosecutor's office. Um, the, the informants had all charges against them in their case dropped, and one was given $10,000 by the government according to the prosecutor's post-sentencing report. Um, since then, he's been in prison but what's interesting about his life is even though he was been incarcerated unjustly 
Um, when you hear him speak, he sounds like one of the most freest people you've ever met. The, my next piece that I that I um submitted for for this exhibit deals upon the idea about what does freedom mean to mean to people, what does it mean to myself, and how do we overall define define freedom, liberty, as what you see on the screen currently. Um, symbols play an important role on describing freedom. So on, the, um, I have Lady Liberty staring off in the distance, staring at at the person that is observing the painting. And on the right side, I have the Liberty Bell. Um, when you look in the at the person in the painting, um, her face has has the Statue of Liberty that was constructed in the in the Caribbean of a black woman holding holding a lantern. Uh, on the top of her, on the top of the person uh, person's head, you have the United States flag because the because that flag represents liberty to people, but un but under that you also have a Confederate flag, and and for certain people that that can also mean a level of freedom and liberty to them as well. So overall, I'm just I'm I'm not trying to make a a statement. I'm just documenting my observations on what does freedom mean to people. And I want to encourage people to be able to ask and answer that question for themselves to the best of their abilities. And if we can go to the to the next painting, I can I can describe more in depth about Franz Bauer's life. So in two thousand sixteen, I was I connected with his daughter um, in a business mentorship program. And she was helping me develop a program that I was working on because based off based upon um, my work that I wanted to do with hospice patients. And with with those hospice patients, I would create a portraits of them to document their legacy. My way to be able to help them work through the grieving process that comes that comes with being in hospice for the the patient as well as for their loved ones. So around this time, uh, we discovered that Mr. Veranza had cancer, and being that his age and how long has he's been in the correctional facilities, there was no guarantee that. He, he may survive. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to take this program and and give for Mr. Uh, my mentor a gift. So with that painting, um, when you look at the certain symbols, I use those symbols based off of an interview that I heard of Mr. Veranza that he did back in 2005. Um, on the left corner of the painting, you have the Black Panther that has a look of concern. And I'm, the reason why I put that there, I imagine that's the feeling that Mr. Veranza felt when he saw um, the treatment of his community with amongst each other, as well as with police relations during that time in the 70s. Uh, 
and on the bottom you have a silhouette image of black panthers um formed formed in formed in a, in a line as an army to represent themselves as an organized force of protection over that community now on the right side you have the lion of judah flag which you see associated with like the rastafarian rastafarian movement um the lion the lion is covering the head of veranza's daughter as a sign of royalty and protection and the x in the background represents the respect that that veranza has for the late malcolm x or El Had. The faded, the faded white on the bottom of the painting represents the continuation of his story. Um, is I've been updated that that um his cancer was been re in remission, and I'd use that that white to represent that his fight for freedom still continues, and his fight to see the improvement of other inmates. And some of the some of the healing work that he does within the correctional facilities with the younger inmates um, continues on. Uh, Jalen and uh, we'll have a chance with to chat with you a little bit later too, as well as everyone else. But just to have a conversation about the art, I'd just like to uh, take this opportunity to. Uh, to introduce the Prison Arts Collective as well. Uh, the Prison Arts Collective evolves from the philosophy and practices of socially engaged art and community activism. Its oversight, development, and organizational structure are consistently influenced by principles of mutuality and collaboration and support creative rehabilitation and principles of restorative justice. The Prison Arts Collective now facilitates weekly art programming in 10 California state prisons with the support of Arts and Corrections, an initiative of the California Arts Council and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. CDCR Innovative Pro Programming Grants and a National Endowment for the Arts Artwork Grant. Um, now, uh, so we have with us Sophie Vrandelis, um and uh, Stan Hunter, uh, but first we will view a spoken word piece from Wendy Staggs, uh, another artist with uh, Prison Arts Collective called What It Is. What it is and what it isn't. I'm just trying to be the biggest person I know how to be. Watching the sunrise and the sunset, trying never to forget why I'm here on this pier, protected from the storm's waves. New roads, new paths, trying to be paved. Man, what the hell is wrong with us? All this racism and prejudice? Some see skin and some see color and others see race, but me? I just see that beautiful person in that face. You say vaginal walls, I say they don't define me. All they've done is keep the man inside of me. Too bad I couldn't hold him down or keep him from beating on me or sleeping around. I don't know, maybe a man could be trustworthy instead of him always having to send me away on a gurney. What it is and what it isn't. I'm just trying to be the biggest woman I know how to be trying to overcome childhood trauma, escaping the gossip and the drama, not small, growing tall, cause damn it, I have a voice after all. Never again to be silenced by the rage and the violence. I'm like a Timex, I keep on ticking, surviving the beatings and the lickings, soaring like eagles with majestic grace and discovering a new realm and a warm, safe place. What it is and what it isn't. I'm just trying to be the biggest. Mother, I know how to be. Won't let my kids be eaten by the streets or deny my mistakes for them to repeat. Hourglass time ticks away as they grow, but a brand new mother they soon will know. I'm healed, I'm strong, and I'm very humble. Foundation firm, no chance to crumble. The daughter and sons that God gave to me will soon see the restoration that he's done in me. No skeletons in closets for me to hide. Transparency is how angels fly. 
what it is and what it isn't. It just is what it is. We have uh, Sophie and uh, Stan from uh, the Prison Arts Collective. Uh, I don't know if you want to, you know, share a little bit about uh, your organization and what you do. Yes, thank you, Marlon. Um, so my name is Sophie Verdellis, and I am a public relations marketing intern for Prison Arts Collective right now. Um, Prison Arts Collective is a university-based nonprofit initiative that is dedicated to expanding the transformative power of the arts to people who are incarcerated. All of our classes include four elements. That is the cultivation of a safe space, art history, art making, and reflection. Our collaborative teaching teams consist of faculty, students, staff, and peer leaders, and we offer an in-depth arts facilitator training to empower people who are incarcerated to become leaders and community builders. Um, Prison Arts Collective is based in San at San Diego State University and has chapters at three additional CSU campuses, San Bernardino, Fresno, and Fullerton. We are a project of Arts and Corrections, a partnership of California Arts Council and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. We currently provide arts programming on 17 yards and 11 correctional institutions in California. Um, these have all been through distance learning and the, a form of mailed in packets and instructional, instructional videos um, since March 2020 due to the pandemic. Our classes are generally a balance of our teachers' expertise and what our participants are interested in learning. Um, examples of past classes include foundations in art and beginning and intermediate courses in painting, drawing, paper sculpture, and printmaking and special topics such as color theory, patterns around the world, contemporary crafts, art history and critique, and art and meditation. Um, each of these classes are formatted around our students' interests as well as our teachers' expertise, like I said. Um, we believe in art as a human right and that it has a capacity to change lives for the better. We aspire to bridge societal gaps through our art and believe that every voice matters. Um, so we have three artists in this virtual gallery. Um, we have Stan, Wendy, and Ray. You saw Wendy's video, and I just want to give you a brief description of who they are. And if Stan can hear or answer any questions, we'll go to that. Um, so Raymond Sharp went to prison in 1988, and he was 17 years old at the time. He served 31 years and seven months and has been out for a year. Ray mentioned that art allowed him to retain his sanity and eventually begin the healing process, which is thankfully continuing for him. Um, Wendy, whose video you just saw, in addition to being a formerly incarcerated person, has worked as a substance abuse counselor with the prison system. Having overcome her own trauma, Wendy has a passion to speak for those who have been silenced, not only by their trauma, but by failing judicial and prison systems. Her journey of self-discovery was nurtured by way of participating in the arts while incarcerated. She has become an outspoken driving force in con conferences across the nation and will not stop speaking out until there is some sort of resolve for change. Wendy has also become the first alumni of Prison Arts Collective to become an advisory board member. Stan, who is on the screen too, um, was formerly incarcerated and found that his pivotal point of rehabilitation was finding a paintbrush and a set of pencils. Instead of feeling the need to escape through drugs, art became the vehicle that drove him to transform his life. While serving time, he was confined into an 8 by 10 concrete cell, um, but when he painted, he felt like a free man. In 2013, while still incarcerated at the California Institution for Men, Stan met Professor Annie Buckley, now the director of San Diego State University School in Art and Design, and also our founder. Um, together, they began this program that has since evolved into a statewide program, the Prison Arts Collective. Um, and today, Stan is a lead teaching artist with Prison Arts Collective and educates incarcerated individuals, encouraging them to make a positive impact on society. Um, and you saw some of their pieces and I will open it up to questions for them later on. Thank you. Cool. Um, 
thanks so much, uh, Sophie. And um, so I guess sort of to just open up the conversation between the artists here and the, um, the sort of art organizations here, and in light of uh, Dr. Bailey Davis amazing presentation this morning, which uh, you guys may or may not have caught. Um, what role do uh, do you feel your work or the work of artists you work with or some like the community work you do uh, around art plays in this movement that we've seen emerge forcefully in the wake of the recent murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the countless other murders over the years, decades and centuries to reform or revamp the role of the police and uh, the justice system and, and mass incarceration? Anyone can speak if they have sort of a, their mood to. Well, I would like to speak about that issue in particular because the artists that we have all suffer from the injustices of the past. In Charles Lawson's case, he was beaten into a false confession through police misconduct, and he also had no parent present. He had no, um, legal uh, expertise there when he was arrested. So they speak directly from their experience to what's happening now. Um, I think that it's important to hear from these people and I think it's a terrible thing that we have allowed so many people to be kept away from the conversation who need to be here. I would much prefer that Charles Lawson or Zafir, Danny Gwynn, and Renee Ortiz could be here right now because they have volumes to speak and they have written it all down and I can read it to you. Uh, for example, Danny Gwynn just wrote, I want my paintings to project the social injustice of the world. I wanna bring awareness to people that my art works tell the story of systemic deconstruction of the black race and of the de self-destructive culture that stunts America's growth. He's speaking specifically to what's happening right now. His latest painting shows a young girl on, on the bridge and speaks to our loss of John Lewis. So these are voices that we need to hear from and I would like to see the prison system open up to allow deeper conversation. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, does anyone else have any sort of thoughts to add to um, that sort of like role of art and like arts-based organizations in like, you know, making a change that like we might want to see for the world? Well, I think can for I... me, yeah. sorry, um, I think no, for- No, go ahead, Jalen. I think, I think for me as an artist, there's a responsibility to be able to to document things as they are and be unabashedly truthful about how things are through through your artwork and on another end of that is to also to, to also be able to document how things should be and what things could be to give to be able to give different audiences especially those who don't who do not have a voice to have the platform on your artwork to be able to speak to speak about these different perspectives personally as as an artist no. Definitely. I mean, that's, you know, I feel like in my mind anyway, that's sort of the, the crucial role in like, you know, art just to be able to like share, share your perspective. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the essential role of art. You sort of have a, you think about, you imagine something, then you show it. And yeah, I don't know if, um, so a lot of the work that uh, you all do sort of um, involves engaging artists with sort of like the, the wider community. Um, I know that like Jalen, for instance, you sort of um, have like a, a nonprofit that sort of helps to like artists to grow their sort of creative careers. And, um, you know, Prison Arts Collective, you sort of work 
in sort of state prisons as well as like with people who are are out of the jails i don't i'm not I, I don't remember if that was the case but um i guess can you speak to like the role of artists in just like engaging with you know the wider community and how that looks for you and your organization can i speak about uh oh I was, You're good. You can talk. <laughs> no, no, look, go ahead. I was. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to one of the driving forces of the artists we have in Art for Justice, and that is to reach out to young people in the community today. It's been years and years that there's been great deprivation in some communities in our in our country, and uh, Charles Lawson wrote with me a program called Roadmap for Life. And we have brought this program to the Montgomery County Youth Detention Center since 2012. We couldn't go this year. And it's an absolutely phenomenal program. And I just wanna read what he wrote. He's wrote, and this is to, if there's any kid in Philly listening right now, growing up in Philadelphia, I knew the poverty and violence that young people live with every day. Peer pressure and con was a constant reality and survival was dependent on how you were perceived. So we show his art, we show art by other individuals and they read their statements. And then he says, one of my goals is to inspire youth to look to their own talents and turn away from violence, which can lead to criminal the criminal justice system. And I think that it, these, these words to the youth, especially who are caught in these times with poverty, violence, a poor educational system is a critical piece and art can cross that bridge. Yes, Thanks, and Andrew. adding on to that, thank you. Um, adding on to that, uh, Prison Arts Collective works with, to answer your question, Marlon, um, yeah. Prison Arts Collective works with participants within the prisons as well as when they get out. So um, some of our participants are on the board now. Um, they are on our team now. And so we really are appreciative of all of them um, continuing to work with us. But I think that it's really important. Um, Prison Arts Collective really focuses on the transformative power of the arts and, you know, really reaching out to people who may have not had that opportunity, that creative outlet before. So once they're given the, these tools, um, it's really amazing to see what they can do. Um, and like it was said before, like there are, you know, a lot of our participants had never picked up a paintbrush or never picked up a pencil. And that's how Stan was. And um, once he was given these tools and that sort of like self-confidence, um, you know, the, the limits were endless. So, um, you know, you can see based on their art that they're just really creative individuals and they have so much talent, so. That's really amazing. That's like, you know, just is kind of moving to sort of imagine like someone, people who may not have even thought that sort of art or like getting into the arts was like something that would be like valuable and meaningful in their lives. And so then it's sort of like, you know, offering this opportunity to like, you know, to be, be an artist essentially. And, you know, then people find that that sort of levels, like brings their experience up into like a whole nother level of just existing. Um, we have a comment actually from, um, from our audience, uh, from an Akil Robertson who said that he was incarcerated with Charles Lawson and just sort of saying that he's an amazing man and was was honored to be in the mural arts program with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's just, you know, the the people that the p art that we're sharing today has like sort of this wider impact in terms of like the people that have been engaging with the artists. Um, OK, let's see. Uh, I guess like one of the sort of somewhat interesting things that I've found was just kind of like the the challenges of like getting and showcasing art from people who are who are currently behind the walls like who are currently in jail just because there's so much like you know difficulty even in like getting getting to them and like communicating with them how does that sort of you know can you anyone like speak to that um like sophie or um or Anne marie 
Well, I can speak to the change. It used to be that we could years ago, and I met Charles Lawson in 1995, uh, for years, I would take many photographs. I think he had over 300 photographs from me, and he would use these photographs to pick and to compose a painting. I sent uh, photographs to other artists as well. You can't do that anymore. Um, mm. And it, wow. the way I would do it is I would send maybe 20, 30 uh, photos. They would pick what they wanted, and then I'd blow it up and send it back so that it was really a collaboration and they, he would say, I want this. Can you find me that? Can you get, get me a child with a you know, certain mm -hmm. look on their face? This is not possible anymore. And it, they put so many restrictions with this new, you can't even write directly to a person in Pennsylvania wow. who's incarcerated. So years ago, when I first met him, we could send art supplies. You can't do it anymore and it has to all come through the commissary there's so many barriers i don't think people realize that many years ago when governor shap was governor there was like a two hundred thousand dollar art fund for people who were incarcerated now they throw barriers in in the way to people painting their own story i'm not saying mm. that uh, programs that paint murals aren't valuable but to paint your own, what's in your heart, what's in your soul, and to put it together is really a very creative process and it should be encouraged, not discouraged. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess so, so we're just about, um, you know, done with like the time that we have, but um, the, to sort of, conclude, I guess, um, we actually didn't show one of Jalen's pieces that um, was pretty like, personally, like impactful for me. Yeah, that's the one Jalen. Um, and so can you speak a little bit more to the, the inspiration um, about like a piece like this, for instance? I mean, I remember you were saying it's not necessarily about making a statement as it is just about seeing what's there and kind of expressing it. Um, I don't know. Can you sort of speak more to that and how you develop your ideas? Um, I was my how I go about the process of developing my ideas is is through educating myself. Mm. So I have this is very it's a very organic process. Usually, maybe about a week or two weeks before I begin a painting. Um, I'll run across some information, whether through a book or article on a certain subject. And then that that subject, it will evolve into ideas into my mind. And then I want to manifest that idea onto, uh, onto a canvas. So that particular painting, um, I completed about a couple of years ago. And I found myself coming across um, literature on the history of of how the development of the police system that we have today and i called this painting called the dangerous class because a part of police history is um the slave catcher history so on the on one half of the person's face you have a a wanted person for a, run a runaway slave. And that's one of the old runaway slave patrol badges. And on the right side, you have a more modern police police badge. And I, I have the red and blue siren siren colors. But on the but the red, there's dripping down with the blood of a of a, a victim gunned down because during this time this was this was probably around the times of we're coming off of mike brown mm. and so i wanted to to document that history but also the feelings of the apathy that people feel especially those in the black community towards the policing system itself and I put a hoodie around because, because this was based off a series that I created called the Hoodie Series. And the Hoodie Series was was kind of a play off of 
the the case of Trayvon Martin, him being in him being in the hoodie, and what that stereotype holds for um, black people in in United States society. And so I would put hoodies around different subject matters, and on the face of the subject, I would put um, I would document either conversations I've had with people. Uh, based off of whether it's social, political, or economic, or everyday life issues. And I will put those issues onto the face to give it, to give as much representation as possible. And all these conversations were inspired by conversations I've had by different Black men and women, as well as Black children that I've, that I've had engagements, engagements within the um, education system. Thanks, uh, Jalen. That was, uh, you know, it's really interesting about just, you know, it's part of a larger series. And, you know, you have like this, this hoodie series that's inspired by Trayvon Martin. And, you know, this sort of the hoodie being like this sort of so called reasoning for like, you know, allowing a murder to happen, which is just like, you know, absurd, and taking that symbol and placing it in sort of different contexts just it sounds like a really interesting series um i guess to sort of to close out a little bit too uh, i was really so, like you know we have a uh, stan hunter on here and i think his his audio wasn't really working that well uh but i'd really love to see uh some of his work um displayed um on sort of on the screen for you all there was um i think about three three pieces that we have of his up on a website well that's actually I think a piece from, you can sort of speak to some of the work, Sophie, I think. Yes. <clears throat> so this is um, Stan's piece. Um, I think we titled it Creation. Um, and this is paint all by paint. I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry. I don't wow. know as much about it as he does, but um, yeah, this is one of his pieces. And then um, the piece before was actually Raymond's, but um, there are two more maybe go to the next one um this one i do know a little bit about um so this is titled cycle of violence um and he created this um it's kind of a reflection of what he's been through um there are people all around the room dealing with their own problems their own trauma um and you can notice the little boy in the center who's left alone, a little bit abandoned. Um, so this one, this is one of my personal favorites of stands. It's super powerful and um, just really well done. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Cool. Thank um, you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for being here. Um, we're gonna, uh, we're just gonna close out. Um, but everyone who's on the uh, who's on the call or who's watching the webinar, uh, please uh, definitely stay tuned. We're going to show a slide that'll have a link for you to um, register for the next webinar, uh, which is a really exciting um, workshop uh, titled "Caging Through Education." So it's kind of going to be about how the education system and the the system of mass incarceration have kind of become like intricately linked, especially in sort of com like communities, neighborhoods of color, poor neighborhoods, um, just this sort of the school to prison pipeline concept. Uh, we'll have a little bit more going in depth about that next, uh, starting at one o'clock. Uh, so, you know, grab some food for yourself, like, you know, get some, you know, go about your day, but then come back at uh, one o'clock and uh, we'll have more uh, great um, justice reentry and healthcare summit content for you. Thanks so much. And thanks again to all the artists who came here, uh, the Prison Arts Collective, Sophie and Stan, to uh, Jalen Davis. Thanks so much for chatting about uh, your work and your process. And to Anne-Marie, thanks so much for sharing the work of um, the folks who do stuff with uh, Art for Justice, uh, always a pleasure, uh, all of you, and uh, have a great day.